Welcome to Have You Heard with Heather Darling. I'm Heather Darling and today's guest is Senator Doug Steinhardt. Doug Steinhardt is the New Jersey State Senator representing New Jersey's 23rd Legislative District and Chairman of the Warren County Republican Committee. He is the former Chairman of the New Jersey State Republican Committee and Mayor of Lepat Kong Township. Doug's a name partner at Florio Perucci, Steinhardt, Capelli, Tipton, and Taylor. His legal career began as a clerk in the Superior Court before joining his father, Joseph Steinhardt, in their law practice. And in 2005, he helped to form Florio Perucci, Steinhardt, Capelli, Tipton, and Taylor, which is now recognized by New Jersey Business and Industry Association as one of the top law firms in the state of New Jersey. Doug is committed to community service as the co-chairman of the Warren County Addiction Awareness Task Force and the Warren County Mental Health Task Force. He was a member of the Legislative Committee of New Jersey League of Municipalities and a former member of the Warren County Regional Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. He's a certified Red Cross volunteer, served on the Executive Board of Directors of the Central New Jersey Council of the Boy Scouts of America, and he himself is an Eagle Scout. Doug received a BA in History from Gettysburg College and Juris Doctor from Widener University School of Law. Welcome to the show, Senator. It's so nice to be here. Thank you so very much for inviting me. Happy to see you. Um, so you're the newest Republican senator down in Trenton. You replaced Mike Dougherty when he moved to an open seat in county government. What were the most important issues for you when you decided to enter the Senate? No, I, I think most New Jerseyans have relatively simple wants. They, they, they want to live and work safely and securely in a, in a house they can afford, in a state they can afford to live in. So going to Trenton for me was an opportunity to, to try to do good work to make people's lives better. I think we had our, our three R's of grammar school. I guess to me, there's like four R's of government, right? Uh, reduce taxes, relax regulations, reward people for hard work. Uh, and respect the U.S. Constitution. So, I mean, those are my four R's. Uh, went down to try to follow that roadmap in Trenton and uh, to do the best job I can to do exactly those things. Those are some great R's. What kind of progress have you made? I, I know you've been there a short time, but what kind of progress have you made on those R's so far? Well, thanks. So hopefully lots. Um, you know, baby steps. It's been probably... I guess I got sworn in December 19th. The day I got sworn in, I was actually able to cast my first vote against uh, the concealed carry ban here in New Jersey. Uh, I'm a big defender of the Second Amendment and believe in families' rights to protect themselves. Um, but uh, since then, you know, just fighting entitlement programs, working to cut red tape to make New Jersey a bit more uh, affordable and attractive for businesses and people to stay here, um, and, you know, voting against bigger government, trying to keep government more transparent, cutting down on the kind of costs that make New Jersey unaffordable for a lot of families to live here, work here, or, and even retire here. Well, I can attest to your support of the Second Amendment by virtue of the fact that you've been trying to teach me how to get half decent at clay shooting for a couple of years now. Um, have other issues arisen that have supplanted the issues or the importance of the issues that you went to Trenton looking at? Well, one of the first things, one, one of the things that popped up on our plate, which you know, I'm sure you're very much uh, acutely aware of, too, uh, is this, the judiciary shortage. There's really a backlog right now um, with trying to get judges on the bench. Uh, and that, it's a slippery slope because it affects everybody's lives that, you know, have, have to deal with whether they want to or not the court system. Uh, so, you know, litigants, the folks that work there, et cetera. Uh, the, the the pandemic, I think, shined uh, really shined the light on the problem. Uh, but government and I and I put myself in that in that category. Uh, you know, the legislature needs to do a better job of working with uh, the governor's office, the executive, to make sure that we're getting uh, judges on the bench, uh, keeping the judiciary moving in the way it needs to uh, to be an effective uh, third branch of government. Uh, and in that and in that same vein, uh, I've had conversations with the chief justice. I mean, I think. You know, the, the allocation of judges amongst vicinages hasn't been visited and revisited in decades. Uh, we have vicinages that have far more judges than they have population compared to some of their brother and sister vicinages. So, uh, you know, I think we need to look long and hard at reallocating judges uh, so that they're, every vicinage is kind of equally represented, judges to population. But 
Uh, that propped up relatively early. Um, then there's always the daily constituent work. Um, I was for, I'm fortunate to inherit great staff. Uh, I kept Senator Doherty's uh, staff on when I came in. It, it, it made sense to me, considering how long Mike had been in the Senate, uh, that there was no need to fix what wasn't broken. They kind of knew who was who and where things needed to go and how things got done. So uh, Dawn, Liz, uh, and Patty do a wonderful job. And, and I'm happy to have them, happy to be able to keep working with them now in the current Senate office, making sure that or answering the questions of, of the constituents that are calling out issues that need to be addressed. You were the Republican state chairman only a few years ago. How do you think that impacted your acclimation to your role in the Senate? Yeah, totally different different hats. You know, it's interesting. I, I was a mayor for a little while, been a county chairman for almost 20 years now, spent about four years as the state chairman. Um, the, the chairman's role, uh, as you might uh, uh, imagine is a bit more of that that cheerleader role uh, you know kind of kind of hurting and and, and rooting along and recruiting candidates trying to make sure that we get folks elected uh, so to be able to 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 move from that hat uh, where there are, are less consequences I should say you know in terms of the things that you say or how you say them uh, you can be a bit more aggressive sometimes uh, and a bit more partisan uh, than going to the legislature where you become a policymaker uh, and you know your, your your goal is significantly different yeah we still want to get Republicans uh, elected to the legislature yeah we still want to uh, make sure that we control the state legislature to try to get the state you know turn back to the right and get back in the right direction but uh, your responsibilities are significantly different so to be able to roll up my sleeves and dig into policy and a policy to discussions and policy debates and, you know, try to work an idea from an idea to a bill to through a committee to law is, is a really fascinating process for me that I'm still learning every day. But having been state chairman, uh, you know, I was fortunate to know or get a chance to know a little bit about who all the players were, uh, but now to be able to kind of work in the same room with them is a totally different experience. So you serve on budget and appropriations and labor committees. What personal experience of yours brings, allows you to bring the most value to those committees? I guess beyond uh, working and paying taxes for most of my adult life, um, budget and labor seemed kind of two natural places to go. Budget was by choice. You know, I asked to be on the budget committee. Uh, there was a vacancy there. Uh, and I think anybody that wants to have a, a truly working understanding uh, of how state government works should spend some time on budget committee. I think it's a good place to go, uh, kind of roll up your sleeves and understand the inner workings of the state's finances uh, or, you know, uh, failures of the state's finances, depending on how you want to look at it. But, uh, you know, we're about to start the budget hearing process this week. I'll be at my first uh, budget committee hearing on Thursday. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. But uh, I'm curious to see uh, how we manage to, to misspend $54 billion, uh, you know, a year. Uh, and, you know, how the budget that we've, we've, uh, are looking at this year is, is literally 50% higher than the, the last year's budget when Governor Christie left office. So, you know, I have long said that I don't think the state has, has a revenue problem. I think we have a spending problem. Uh, so having a chance to interact with the various department heads, I've started doing that already. Uh, even before the governor introduced his budget, I was making outreach to all of the various major department heads from corrections to uh, to the Department of Transportation, to the DEP, uh, Department of Agriculture, or you name it, uh, asking to speak to every commissioner and every department head to kind of get a better sense of on what they do uh, and what they do with the money that, that, that all of us taxpayers send them year in and year out. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to getting a much better understanding of what the state does uh, with the money that it has. Labor, again, it's just kind of another issue near and dear to me, um, wanting to do the best I can to try to make sure that New Jersey remains an affordable place uh, for people to work, that we're creating jobs, not chasing them away, that we're providing an attractive environment for businesses, a welcoming environment for people to come and open up a business rather than have to force those businesses across the river or to other states that 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 to, to companies may seem more attractive. Um, you know, so labor was a spot that was important to me as well, both from uh, an, an employer and an employee perspective. It seems like um, business is, is one of your main focuses with your legislation. Farming sure. is also something, and, and safety of our nation, of our state of our nation is something. So let's see if we can go over a couple of those and talk about what, you're, what you've been doing and what you've been proposing. So you have S30, uh, S369, which requires the sure. division, Director of Division of Taxation to conduct a study on the impact of state business economic ta income taxation. Uh, with regard to out-migration, formation, 
and employment. So you want to talk about that for a little while? Well, sure. I mean, I, Governor Mayor Murphy, back when I was state chairman, uh, famously or infamously, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, made the statement that if the taxes were your issue, uh, were probably not your state, referring to New Jersey. The problem with that is that, uh, you know, they're everybody's issue. Uh, New Jersey continues to lead the nation or, you know, is always at the top of the list or near the top of the list uh, of states for out-migration of both people and jobs. Uh, and that's a slippery slope. You know, the more businesses that leave, the more people that leave, uh, and the more the budget creeps up, the harder it is uh, and the higher the burden for every one of us that remain here. Uh, those of us that, that just love New Jersey and don't want to leave and those of us who can't afford to. Uh, so, um, you know, that the purpose of that bill uh, was to really force uh, the Division of Taxation to take a look and come back to us with some honest answers on the impacts of the out-migration of both people uh, and jobs, uh, the, the impact on the out-migration of, you know, businesses uh, and companies, uh, large and small, to get a better sense of exactly what kind of impact that's having uh, on on uh, our state, not only from a budgetary perspective, uh, but just from a family fiscal perspective. S-3625 is sure. your bill. It prohibits public institutions of higher education from accepting gifts and donations from foreign adversaries, which is to me very interesting because we've seen issues with China creeping into our education system, their influence. Is, is that what's behind this or is there more behind this? No, it's very much, a, it's, it's almost exactly what's behind it. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I want to be clear at the outset because a lot of these bills, like the, the farmland bill was kind of tagged like as a China bill. And, and this kind of gets tight as a China bill. And I know there's a lot going on right now between U.S. Chinese relationships. But you know, I want to be clear at the outset that that these bills are really designed to deal with with governments whose interests are hostile to ours here in the United States. Um, and, you know, not the Chinese Americans generally. We have, a, you know, a, a very a very healthy population uh, of Chinese uh, American families that contribute uh, to you know every piece of the fabric of what makes New Jersey and America a great country, a great state, and a great country. But, you know, at the same time, I think we need to be mindful of not doing things uh, and, you know, not allowing uh, countries whose interests are hostile to ours to be infiltrating, you know, every piece of American life, uh, whether it's manufacturing, uh, infrastructure or agriculture, or in this case, you know, allowing them to to buy their way into American universities uh, and institutions that are, in a lot of respects, uh, largely responsible for kind of molding the minds of you know our next generation of leaders. So, uh, putting uh, a a magnifying glass on where those funds are coming from and how they're being used and what influence they're being used to try to 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 buy uh, is something I think all of us need to be keenly aware of. Next bill, S-3665, prohibits government entities from procuring and using technology products and services from companies owned by, controlled by, or domiciled in certain foreign countries. Now, we're looking at a congressional consideration of a ban on TikTok. Is this similar to that? Yeah, very much so. Uh, but I think the federal ban uh, is, a, is a bit more limited in scope. Uh, again, um, you know, 3665 is, is broader. No, no country that the state or federal government has identified as a cybersecurity threat would be able to make investments in, uh, in that critical infrastructure that you identified. Uh, and the, the, again, the, the purpose uh, is largely to not allow uh, critical components uh, of New Jersey uh, or national infrastructure to fall into the hands of, of our enemies or people who have interests that are, that are contrary to ours. Um, you know, we, we, during the course of reviewing the history of the agriculture bill, the one that, that, that would preclude, uh, hostile foreign governments or foreign governments or hostile foreign individuals that are financed by hostile foreign governments or owning, uh, New Jersey agricultural land. Uh, you know, I was surprised to learn how many things we've already offloaded, if you will, uh, to foreign adversarial governments. Um, you know, vitamin C, uh, once, uh, you know, produced here by companies like Hoffman La Roche are now largely produced in China. Um, the uh, penicillin G strand, the one that's, that is the primary source for producing most penicillin antibacterial drugs. Uh, is controlled solely by, uh, you know, the Chinese government. Most of the active ingredients that go into so many of the other pharmaceuticals that those of, that a lot of us use every day come from China. Uh, so, you know, making sure that we're no uh, that we don't allow ourselves to become uh, reliant on or beholden to our foreign adversaries, I think, is is 
of critical importance to us as things are shifting and ever changing on the on the on the international landscape. I'm going to skip ahead for a second to a question that I was going to ask you. I don't remember the the number of the bill, but you do have one pertaining to um, certain subsidies or discounts for first time farm buyers and certain education. Sure. Is, is that to keep New Jersey the garden state and help alleviate some of the issue that you just said, bringing things back to Jersey and American soil? Yeah, very much so. So it's it's, it's Senate Bill 3575, um, co-priming with uh, Senator Cruz Perez. Uh, and, you know, you're right, the garden, New Jersey's the garden state. And I happen to, you know, you and I happen to be fortunate to kind of live in that sort of that northwest, north central corridor where we still very much are the garden state. Uh, but you know, a lot of those 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 farm families uh, are are you know disappearing. Uh, the industry is becoming harder and harder to for folks to make a living at. Um, and while preservation in and of itself, preserving farmland is admirable, um, you know, a lot of those farm families are getting older and older. Uh, their children don't want to be in farming anymore, uh, or they look for other industries where they can make more money. Uh, so, you know, what that bill does would uh, allow county agriculture development boards uh, to resell preserved farms to young farmers in a mentoring program. Uh, so that, you know, older farmers uh, or other farms, established farm families, et cetera, that have been around can help mentor them and get what might otherwise, uh, you know, be fallow farmland back active and being refarmed again. So uh, it provides another revenue stream uh, that can in turn be used to acquire more farmland. It, it helps revive, uh, the, you know, the farm industry in the U.S. to make sure that uh, we're doing a better job of keeping, uh, you know, preserved farms, uh, or potentially productive farmland in a productive uh, farm mode. Uh, and it also helps get, create a whole new generation of New Jersey farmers so that we could be the garden state for you know another two or three or four generations down the road. So it's a really a multifaceted program. Um, and uh, it would also allow, besides just the resale, uh, the ability for young farmers to lease property as well, uh, below the market rate that the, the counties purchased them from. Uh, so again, a little incentive to, to get young farm families uh, back acclimated into the New Jersey farming market. Senator, S3730 establishes Rural Broadband Infrastructure Grant Program in the Economic yeah. Development Authority, and it appropriates $2.5 million in federal funds. It's, for our audience, why is reliable broadband so important for the future, not only of our state, but of the United States generally? Sure, I always I joke that I, the farm that I grew up on that my parents still live on, I mean, we, didn't get, we didn't get cable until after I got out of college. Uh, and used to talk to our neighbors with, you know, red solo cups and strings, but not, not really, but sort of, uh, you know, broadband. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's always been an issue, uh, in, in the rural part of the rural parts of the state, uh, because obviously critical infrastructure is most profitable to, uh, you know, the, the, the companies that, that install uh, and manage them uh, where there's critical mass, uh, you know, more users. So, you know, rural counties like mine, 100,000 people in the whole county or Sussex County, 150,000 people in all of Sussex County aren't quite the same attractive markets as there might be to a Bergen County with a million people. So, uh, you know, but but the pandemic really shined a, a, a light on uh, the shortcomings of, of uh, the ability of rural New Jerseyans to get access to critical uh, broadband infrastructure, critical internet infrastructure, when you couldn't go out to the grocery store anymore, or you couldn't go to your pharmacy, or you wanted to communicate with your doctor, or you wanted to still just run your business online, you know, uh, if you didn't, have, if you're still using dial-up internet, uh, you know, or rubbing two balloons together, hoping to get enough electric to to, to generate a signal, um, it made it really hard for a lot of families to 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 be able to survive. Uh, so, making sure that we get critical infrastructure out to underserved rural communities is extremely important. Uh, we're going to look at every potential avenue out there to make that um, happen, uh, not just up here in the Northwest, but you know, especially in you know the southern parts of New Jersey as well uh, that have similar problems than anywhere else that that don't have. Um, upload or download speeds that you know would be considered reasonable in 2023. You and Senator Durr co-sponsor S3533, which is a bill requiring the Motor Vehicle um, Commission to issue blue envelopes holding documents that are required for operation of motor vehicles to persons with autism. What was the origin of the bill and what kind of support are you getting for that? 
Sure. So I'd love to give credit where credit's due. First of all, that that bill originated with a uh, uh, Republican uh, Assembly Minority Leader John DeMaio, uh, with whom I serve in the 23rd uh, in the in the Assembly, and uh, I was able to introduce the same bill uh, with Senator Durr in the Senate. Uh, it is intended to address those uh, who who um, have autism uh, and may have difficulty communicating uh, with law enforcement officers to, to give them a vehicle, an avenue by which they can immediately, uh, law enforcement and uh, the, the motor vehicle operator can identify immediately that there may be communication issues. Uh, and especially we've all seen, we live in a day and age where law enforcement is under, uh, you know, an increasingly um, scrutinizing microscope uh, to enable folks to be able to communicate or know immediately that they can communicate uh, or know that they might have to communicate differently. Uh, and some of the things that they've police may have learned in training that they would suspect might mean one thing actually would mean something else. So, you know, it was really designed uh, as a means of fostering greater communication between our law enforcement community uh, and those to whom might need it uh, in a particular situation. As we all know, now, for those of us who have been stopped before, and I can't say that I haven't been, uh, they're already stressful enough situations. So add to that the stress of not being able to communicate because you simply can't uh, the same way maybe you and I could with the officer who's, who's trying to, to communicate with us. Uh, this seems like a very smart, sensible, safe, and practical way uh, to, to increase that that dialogue. Um, it's been extremely well received, especially in Warren County. The Chiefs Association here uh, has uh, embraced it. Uh, our, our county commissioners have embraced it and supported it. Uh, everyone we've spoken to on the law enforcement side has been helpful. I'm, I'm anxious to see that move through committee uh, and make it out onto the floor. Senator, you and Senator Testa are co-sponsoring S3534, which goes back to something we were talking about, restricting all ownership of agricultural land in New Jersey by foreign government and persons. Now, as you alluded, your family has a background in farming, and this does have some deep meaning to you. What are the concerns of foreign ownership that give rise to that bill? Well, again, I go back and I, and I would analogize it to what we talked about in terms of uh, cybersecurity, uh, electronic infrastructure, um, a manufacturing infrastructure, pharmaceutical infrastructure. Uh, and I think it's based on the premise that food security uh, is national security. And uh, as we see foreign adversarial governments uh, investing in buying up uh, more heavily uh, in uh, infrastructure in this country, it seems imperative that we make sure that we maintain a critical food supply uh, and do everything we can to cut down on the dependence uh, on other countries, especially countries who may have interests hostile to ours. Uh, so making sure that our food producing properties uh, remain in friendly hands uh, seems critically important to us uh, as, you know, we continue to try to navigate uh, these complex international waters, you know, in 2023. S-3710 prohibits any foreign company, uh, company created under the laws of a foreign adversary from participating in critical infrastructure. So while we see some foreign investment in our economy as positive, how does this bill, and I understand it's in the same vein as what you just spoke about, sure. but how does that protect New Jersey and our citizens? Well, I, I don't think any investment that enriches countries with interests that would be hostile to ours uh, is positive. Uh, so, you know, the purpose of the bill, again, uh, is, and as I think I've, I've learned in the short time I've been in the legislature, uh, a lot of these things are reactive uh, because some of this has been going on for decades. Uh, but, you know, we're beginning to, to, to pay a lot more attention to it. But, you know, 195 countries uh, in the world, uh, not all of them have interests that align with ours. Not all of them have interests that are consistent with ours. Uh, and they're not all friendly. Uh, so to make sure that uh, infrastructure that we may, may need to rely on at a critical or crucial time in the future is not in the hands uh, of, you know, uh, countries who have interests hostile to America's, uh, I think is just proactive, good governance at a point in time when uh, we need to be working on maintaining uh, a strong outward stance, both externally, uh, outside of the, the boundaries of, you know, uh, the landmass of the U.S., as well as internally. One last question in that vein. Yeah. S3666 prohibits ownership of certain protected land adjacent to military facilities 
in the state by certain foreign governments and persons. So I would assume that there's an extra layer of protection that you're seeking there based on adjacent to military facilities. Well, sure, that was more largely on the fact that not every overt or covert act is as uh, blatantly visible as the, uh, you know, the spy balloon. Uh, and the fact that, you know, we've read uh, reports of, um, you know, uh, foreign governments purchasing large swaths of land adjacent to air force bases in states like north dakota we have the joint base here in new jersey um and you know our proximity to to um you know large metropolitan areas like new york and philadelphia and the ports there with are are again critical to us both new jersey nationally and internationally so you know a bill that would prohibit hostile countries from uh, buying up land uh, that would give them even greater proximity than uh, a uh, spy balloon miles up in the sky but maybe a couple hundred yards away on an adjacent property again to me is just good common sense um and uh is is a a proactive and effective means of uh, promoting national security here at home in new jersey senator unfortunately we're out of time it, it always flies when we're getting great information but i want to thank you for coming on the show obviously you've accomplished a tremendous amount in a very short amount of time so um i wouldn't have expected anything different but i'm happy to see that that's the case and uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us again sometime. Well, I'd love to. The pleasure is mine and coming from somebody who's accomplished as much as you have, man, in your career, uh, it's a compliment and I really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. And thanks everyone for watching. We'll see you next week for another episode of Have You Heard with Heather Darling.